It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope you're all doing well. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, I hope you'll get in touch. Give me a call or send an email. I'd love to hear from you. And then please also remember that we are continuing to meet for worship every Lord's Day morning at 9 a.m. So be sure to sign up online for that. This would be a good time to do that while you have your uh, computer or phone open or whatever you're using. And if the 9 a.m. service fills up, you know we are replaying the 9 a.m. service at 10.30 a.m. at the church building using the projector. And so if you need any uh, help signing up for the 9 a.m. service, if you have any questions about your schedule, get in touch with me. If you need any help with the sign-up process on Sign Up Genius, get in touch with Kenna, and she would love to help you through that. If you're listening by phone, if you need any help with this, if you have anything that we need to be praying about, I hope you'll give me a call at 608-224-0274. In terms of good news tonight, I have survived a week of camping on the north shore of Lake Superior in sub-zero weather. It was a great trip about a week and a half ago. I'm very thankful to Josh for teaching the past two Wednesdays from the book of Hebrews and then also to Caleb for preaching on the Sunday I was away. On the picture on the screen right now, I am standing on the shore of Lake Superior. And this is right outside the Black River Harbor, about 15 minutes northeast of Ironwood, Michigan. So you take Highway 51 here in Madison all the way to the end. And that is Hurley. And then Hurley, Wisconsin is right across the Wisconsin border from Ironwood. So I was up there for a while uh, after having camped up north of Duluth, came back through Hurley and Ironwood for a couple nights. And when I walked out there, when I woke up that morning, it was 16 degrees below zero. And Lake Superior was a frozen wasteland, but it was absolutely beautiful. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity to have been away for a few days. One highlight of that trip was picking up three dozen pasties at Joe's Pasty Shop up there in Ironwood. And so we are now fully stocked with pasties for the next few months. In case you don't know, a pasty is basically a handheld meat and potato or rutabaga pocket pie uh, brought to the area from England by the iron and copper miners back in the 1800s, and they are absolutely delicious. I hope you uh, can enjoy a pasty at some point in your life. I think uh, Teddy Wedgers may still be open there uh, right at the top of State Street on the Capitol Square for a, kind of a local taste there. Uh, several weeks ago, in order to help foster a sense of community since we've been apart for so long, I asked whether uh, all of you might be willing to send in some pictures of you and your family watching the live stream, either on Sunday or Wednesday. And you may remember a few weeks ago, I started with a picture from our home, a picture of our daughter watching the live stream when she was home on winter break back in January. And so I was kind of opening that up to all of us since we haven't seen each other for a while. And thankfully, several of you responded. And tonight, we have a couple of pictures from the Morris family, Silas and Kenna and Lucy. And I think they've added a bonus dog since this picture was taken a, a few weeks ago. So I, I hope the new one doesn't feel left out tonight. But we're thankful to see the Morrises down at their home tonight. And then we also had a picture of Lucy uh, paying very careful attention to class a few weeks ago. She's, uh, in my opinion, looking slightly concerned here. And uh, by the way, PowerPoint suggests captions for pictures. Whenever I drag and drop a picture into PowerPoint, as some of you might know, um, they suggest a caption. Would you like to caption it this? And they recognize what was going on here by suggesting the caption, dog lying in front of a TV. And I thought that was hilarious. That a PowerPoint could absolutely see what's going on there. But several of you have sent in pictures. Uh, thank you for doing that. I'll try to share those at the beginning of each class as we go forward in our Wednesday evening studies. And if you would like to join in, I would appreciate it. Just take a picture of your setup as you watch the live stream each week, either on Sunday or on Wednesday. Uh, email that to me, and then I would love to include it, especially since some of us haven't seen each other for a while. Tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke, and in fact we conclude that study tonight. We also conclude our study of the entire Bible tonight. And I'd like to have some more comments about that toward the end of class. But here at the beginning, as we finish Luke, by way of review, in case some of you are joining us for the first time, that is possible with those of you online. We know that Luke is a Gentile. This makes him different from the other gospel writers. He is a medical doctor, and he writes both Luke and the book of Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. And Luke uh, makes a point of writing in chronological order. It is a well-researched account. And he includes a number of people who are often overlooked and sometimes oppressed in the ancient world. Women, widows, Gentiles, Samaritans. 
as well as the sick and the poor. And one final reminder in this study, the Harmony of the Gospels will once again be very helpful tonight. These are available on Amazon for around 25 bucks in the New American Standard Version. Uh, we have one in the church library if you're interested in checking that out to see if you might be interested in going further with that in terms of purchasing it, feel free to check that out. Uh, last week we made it through, or two weeks ago we made it through, a few weeks ago we made it through the day of the Lord's resurrection. So we had his resurrection, we had his appearances, we had several women visit the tomb right around sunrise that Sunday morning. They go tell the others. Then we have Peter and John visit the tomb. We have Jesus appearing to Mary in the garden. We then have Jesus appearing to the other women. We have the Jewish authorities plot with the soldiers to cover up what actually happens here. Uh, then we have Jesus appear to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And later that night, Jesus appears to the apostles. Everybody but Thomas is there that first evening as they are locked in a room together. And Jesus comes through those locked doors. He appears among them and Jesus eats a piece of broiled fish in front of them. Well, tonight we pick up with what happens next. And in the harmony of the Gospels in John's account, in John 20, 26 through 31, we have Jesus meeting with the disciples a week after his resurrection. And I find that interesting, that Jesus seems to be meeting the disciples on the first day of the week. So we have all those meetings on the day of the resurrection. That's a Sunday, the first day of the week. And then as far as I can tell, the next appearance isn't until one week later, the following Sunday. And so to me, it's almost as if Jesus is getting his people in the habit of meeting him on the first day of the week. And I just find that interesting. I thought you might as well. And at this second meeting, Thomas shows up. You may remember Thomas missed the first meeting for some reason a week earlier. And then afterwards, you may remember Thomas says to the others, unless I shall see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand on uh, into his side, I will not believe. That's the day of the resurrection right after he just missed the Lord. Well, now... A week later, Thomas finally has that opportunity. In John chapter 20, Jesus shows up and he immediately says to Thomas, reach here your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side and be not unbelieving but believing. And Thomas uh, never reaches out as far as we're told. He's invited, but he never actually does it. But he responds to Jesus' invitation by saying, my Lord and my God. And so Thomas is convicted. He is convinced when he sees that evidence. By the way, every time that I read or teach from this passage, I want to point out that Thomas is a name that goes back several generations in our family. It's a middle name. It's a first name. And unfortunately, from the Exum point of view, Thomas has a bad reputation, doesn't he? How do people often refer to Thomas? What is his nickname? You know, people often refer to Doubting Thomas. I know I've heard that for many years, but not in our family. We do not refer to Thomas as Doubting Thomas, uh, but rather we will refer to him as Believing Thomas. Thomas is never re described as Doubting in the Bible, but he is described as demanding to see the evidence. And it is good to demand evidence. And when he sees the evidence, Thomas believes. And so in our family, where Thomas is a name that's been passed down from generation to generation, uh, we usually refer to Thomas not as the doubting disciple, but rather as the believing apostle, because he believes when he sees the evidence. In the harmony, the next event is Jesus appearing to seven of the apostles as they are out fishing on the Sea of Galilee in John chapter 21. Uh, they fished all night. They've caught nothing. But as the sun is coming up, they see this figure out there on the beach. And this figure tells them to cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, as if, they, as if they've never thought about that. Uh, these guys are professional. They are commercial fishermen. But this guy in the beach says, hey, have you tried casting the net on the right-hand side? Well, they do it. And, of course, the catch is so huge that they are not able to haul it in. And John recognizes this figure on the beach then at that point as being Jesus. And Peter is the one who jumps into the water and swims for the shore faster than the boat can get there. And Jesus is already there, started cooking some fish on a charcoal campfire. So that confirms that you can, in fact, eat fish for breakfast. And uh, that, that's right there in the Bible. 
Anyway, after breakfast, this is where we have the back and forth between Peter and Jesus. You remember the series of do you love me questions three times back and forth there as Jesus and Peter worked that out between them. Uh, then at some point after this, in terms of the harmony, before we get plugged back into Luke, uh, we have what we refer to as the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and Mark 16. That's where Jesus goes to a mountain uh, somewhere in Galilee. He gives the command to the apostles to basically go everywhere, preaching the gospel, baptizing people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this finally brings us to where we pick up tonight, which is Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 49. So Luke 24, 44 through 49. And I hope this works, but we have a special guest tonight. My dad, Ray Exum, will read our two passages tonight. Uh, dad and I went over to the church building last Friday, and we had a chance to do some recording over there. So I'm thankful Dad was able to do this, and uh, we'll see how this goes. Luke 24, verses 44 through 49. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ must suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Thank you, Dad. Dad was a, a good sport with this. I think I sprang it on him on the way to our uh, on the way to the church building the other day. But I, I told him he was contributing to the advancement of technology. So uh, we are trying to include more people in the live stream. This is one way of doing that, and we learned a lot the last couple of days, even trying to get the audio right on this. So we appreciate Dad for reading this tonight. But what do we have going on here in Luke 24, 44 through 49? Well, Jesus basically is telling his disciples, what you have seen over the past three and a half years, all of this is the fulfillment of everything that was written in the law, in the prophets, and the Psalms. And so Jesus is saying that he personally is the fulfillment of all scripture up to this point in history. It is all about him. So this is a summary statement of everything that they've seen and heard and experienced over the past three and a half years. This is it. And then in verse 45, Jesus opens their minds to understand the scriptures. As I understand it, the apostles now have perhaps the supernatural ability to understand all of God's word in a way that they haven't before. There's discussion, uh, obviously, as to whether this is just Jesus' teaching them again, or whether this is supernatural. To me, it seems that he opens their minds in some supernatural way by way of inspiration. And so uh, now they, they fully understand that Jesus' death and resurrection is, in fact, the fulfillment of prophecy. And personally, I kind of wonder when I read this passage, why didn't Jesus reveal these things miraculously from the beginning? In other words, why do we have basically three and a half years of ignorance? It seems that Jesus wanted his apostles to learn some of these things by experience. In other words, as they teach others, and as others don't get it right away going forward, the apostles have been there. And so they understand the challenge involved in believing an account like this. And so they have been like Thomas was, not believing right away, but demanding evidence and then waiting for a while and then finally coming around to an understanding of it. Perhaps the non-miraculous learning was a way of encouraging empathy. And I think even today, as we read, it's very easy for us to make fun of the apostles for being so slow sometimes. Why didn't they get it? They're with Jesus. Why didn't they understand? And yet in reality, we are probably just about as slow as they were. In verse 47, Jesus emphasizes repentance as he explains that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. We know repentance is a change of mind, a change of heart, resulting in a change in the way that we live. 
when we meet Jesus in his word, the honest heart will start to change. Repentance is the direct result of Jesus' resurrection. Because he died and came back from the dead, we repent. His resurrection changes everything for us. The gospel, the good news, the death, burial, the resurrection. It is an invitation to repent. Notice we also find in verse 47 that this repentance would be preached beginning from Jerusalem. And of course, that's exactly what happens just a few weeks later, starting with Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. I would also point out in verse 48 how Jesus says that you are witnesses to these things. The apostles were literally eyewitnesses, weren't they? They actually saw what Jesus is describing here. They saw everything Jesus did. Uh, just a brief comment here. Sometimes today people talk about uh, witnessing for the Lord. And the idea is we need to be telling people how the Lord has changed us. And I understand, I appreciate the thought, but I would just point out that we are not really witnesses in the sense that the apostles were witnesses. We have not seen the Lord with our own eyes as they did. And so it's not about us today. Uh, it's all about him and everything we know about him comes to us from his word. And so while there may be a value in telling people what the Lord has done for us personally, I believe there's a much greater value not in pointing them to us, but rather in pointing them to the word of God. And I say that because in verse 48, uh, they are witnesses, but we are not, at least in the same sense they were. In verse 49, Jesus closes this section with a reminder that the apostles are to stay in Jerusalem until they are clothed with power from on high. And that's a reference to the day of Pentecost, just a, a few weeks later at this point. So we pick up tonight with the last paragraph in the book of Luke. This is Luke chapter 24, verses 50 through 53. Luke 24, 50 through 53. And once again, Dad will be reading this for us. Luke 24, verses 50 through 53. Luke 24, 50 through 53. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. So here we have what we usually refer to as the ascension. As Jesus ascends back into heaven, he ends with a blessing, and it seems that he's carried up as he is blessing them. Uh, Mark tells us that he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. That's a little detail that we don't have here in Luke. Uh, Acts has a bit of overlap here. And in Acts, Luke tells us that Jesus is received into heaven by a cloud. Uh, Luke also tells us, about some angels who say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. That's from Luke's account over in the book of Acts. In verse 52, Luke tells us that the apostles worship Jesus. And one commentary suggests that this is the first time that all of the apostles are specifically described as worshiping him. And that's a significant event. Again, the, the resurrection changes everything. They then head back into the city of Jerusalem with great joy, and they stay there in the temple praising God. And this is how the book of Luke ends. The, the book of Luke ends in the temple, just as it began in the temple. If you remember way back in Luke chapter 1, Luke starts with Zechariah serving as a priest, going in for his duty that he was performing, seeing an angel in there, and then going a mute until the birth of his son, John, John the Baptist. And so Luke starts and ends in the temple. And Luke closes with the disciples continually in the temple, praising God. As of tonight, we have now finished studying the entire Bible uh, on a verse-by-verse -verse basis. It has taken us nearly 21 years, just about a month short of 21 years, uh, through the years, we started with the books of the Bible on this chart in black. And you may remember that whenever we finished a book, we would change the font to red. And so tonight, everything is red. And I have a little note here under the PowerPoint in the notes section. I've got them all listed as to the dates that we did all of these things. And we started with the book of Acts in the Bussies living room back in April 2000. 
And in addition to our verse-by-verse -verse studies, you'll notice on the slide here that we've also had several topical classes thrown in here and there, not too many. Our focus has been on the Word of God itself, but we did have some units on personal evangelism. We had a class on how we got the Bible. We studied communication, how we interact with each other from a Christian point of view, looking at some scriptures on that. We had a good question about Islam a number of years ago, and so we studied uh, Islam and the history of that religion and what the Bible has to say about it. And then we had the Bible study worksheets. You may remember we did a few months ago. From a practical point of view, uh, when we first moved here, we started with Acts. And at the beginning, uh, we did not have a plan. I just jumped in with the book of Acts, and I had no idea where we were going with that. Uh, Acts took most of the first year, and then we went from Acts to Genesis. Then we went from Genesis back to the New Testament to 1 Corinthians, then back to the Old Testament to Obadiah, then back to the New Testament to Revelation, and so on. So often we would try to go back and forth between the Old and the New so that we're not spending two, three, four years at a time in the Old Testament without any New. So we would spread it out like that. Uh, before we close tonight, I want to make just a few practical observations, just some things that have been on my mind over the past few months looking forward to finishing the Bible in this way, some things that I've learned, uh, some things that I've noticed while teaching through the Bible over the past 21 years. And uh, first of all, by studying the entire Bible verse by verse, uh, we have emphasized the text of God's Word. We believe this as a congregation. This is one of our core beliefs, that the, that the Bible is important. God's Word is important. And by taking it one verse at a time, in a sense, we have forced ourselves to pay attention to it. So we're not focusing on topics primarily. We are focusing on the Word of God. Obviously, uh, we could have very easily studied a long string of topics over the past 21 years, and we would have learned some valuable lessons. Um, but the Word of God is important, and there's a huge value in looking at it together. And so instead of picking and choosing and looking at a topic and going and finding verses that apply to it, um, instead of that, we've rather allowed God to set the agenda for us. And so we're studying this book and then this book and then this book, and we're allowing God to speak to us through his word. And as I've included on the screen here, uh, this includes what we would commonly refer to as the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the Old Testament is roughly three quarters of the Bible. I want to say 77% or something like that in terms of the number of words. And without a focused effort to cover the whole Bible, uh, chances are we would probably spend a lot more time in the new than the old. But just looking back over the past 21 years, it seems to me that the verse-by-verse -verse study has really uh, forced us to look at some passages that we might normally skip over. And so the text is important, all of it. And this has kind of emphasized that to me. There are some things that we've studied that we would not have studied otherwise. Uh, secondly, uh, as we've gone through the whole Bible over the past 20 year, uh, 21 years, I've been impressed with the importance of personal Bible study. If I'm not reading the Bible on my own, and if you at home are not reading the Bible on your own on a regular basis, it would take 21 years to go through the whole Bible in a Bible class, right? That's what we've done. It would take 21 years to go through the Bible verse by verse, a chapter a week. And what's impressed me over the past few years is that's not enough. It's not enough to study the Bible once every 21 years. I mean, it's really cool we've done that, uh, that we've gone through the Bible as a congregation. But if that's all the Bible study we've had over the past 21 years, that is not okay. I hope that makes sense. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but uh, years ago, I remember somebody making the comparison between church and public school. If our Bible study is limited to one or two hours a week, in other words, if we're only studying the Bible when we come together as a church, that would be the equivalent of spending more than 20 years in the first grade. If we let that sink in just a little bit, imagine trying to learn how to read by only studying reading one hour a week. We would never learn how to read if we studied at a rate like that. And yet it's very easy to go to worship or go to Bible class a time or two a week and to somehow think that we're learning the Bible. And it's a great thing to learn together, but that is not enough. So it's great to study together, um, but we need more than that. And so as we've gone through the text in this way, 
uh, I've been impressed personally over and over again with the importance of personal Bible study. Um, I've also been impressed with how methods of teaching have changed over the past 21 years. This is something that I've thought about a number of times the past few months, just thinking back over the years together. Uh, back in April 2000, when we first started the Book of Acts, I created my class notes with a pen and paper, and so handwritten notes. So I went back and looked at my notes on the Book of Acts, and uh, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, these are my handwritten notes. The author is Luke, the uh, proof of that is Luke 1, and so on. And it's just pieces of uh, copy paper stapled together here. So that was the method uh, back when we started in the Bussy's living room, just handwritten notes. Uh, over time, I moved over to the computer, started typing things out. And for a while, um, once we had a church building, we added PowerPoint, didn't we? By uh, printing out images on transparencies to use on the overhead projector. And then we moved to the digital projector. And now we're completely online. Uh, with the audio going out over a dedicated phone line. And so methods have changed. Uh, by the way, when we were just working through the seven churches of Asia, I looked in my folders on Revelation chapters 2 and 3, and one of the things that came up was the uh, transparency with the seven churches of Asia. And I know you can't see this, but a very low resolution, uh, resolution printer, and we used to print these out, and you know how the overhead used to go. You could never be sure if it was upside down, right side backwards or, or whatever. Um, but those were some challenges that we worked through in the early years as we were trying to include some images to help us understand the text that we were studying. So methods have changed through the years. Uh, my process has changed. My study habits have changed through the years. This past week, I was uh, telling uh, John, one of our elders, I think on Sunday we were talking that uh, my old habit was to study for this class all day on Wednesday and then to teach that night. Well, now, since the YouTube video sometimes takes a few hours to upload and process, I can't do that anymore. I can't study all day Wednesday and teach Wednesday night. It, it's messed with my schedule. So now I start class on Monday. I do most of my class prep for this class on Tuesday. I usually record it early Wednesday morning, and then I do the upload and the processing. So that method has changed. And I was telling John, the worst part of this is I've been forced to listen to myself more than ever. Uh, after I record the class, I uh, listen to it myself to make sure it sounds okay. And then Wednesday night at 7.15 comes around and I have to watch class all over again with my family, <laughs> with all of you on Wednesday night. So that kind of takes more time than it used to, I guess. Uh, PowerPoint itself has added probably two to three hours to the prep time for each sermon or Bible class. Research is different now with the internet. And so in terms of methods, teaching through Proverbs was a real challenge. That was something that I had a hard time with. Those of you who were here in 2012 through 2013 may remember that we set up the computer to simultaneously scroll through three translations, the New American Standard, the NIV, and the Message, which is more of a paraphrase. And we thought of those three columns as what the text says, what the text probably means, and what some dude thinks the text means. If you remember that, that was an interesting method to me to study Proverbs verse by verse with no context linking one verse to the other was a challenge. And by combining those resources verse by verse, we made some sense of what Solomon was saying. And so I'm just pointing out that methods have changed through the years. I've also noticed uh, that this weekly class on a long term basis has been good for me personally. I've changed as a preacher because of this class. I've changed as a Christian because of this. Uh, those of you who have taught Bible classes, those of you who have preached, uh, know that you always learn far more in preparing for a class or a lesson than anybody could ever learn as a student or a listener. That's just the way it is. Almost in a sense, I feel like I'm a, I've gone on a journey, kind of studying the Bible, comparing that to going on a journey, and then I come back and I'm trying to explain where I've been. That's one way of explaining what a Bible class is. I'm I'm trying to tell you what I've learned over the last few days. And so it, it's forced me to study things that I normally wouldn't study. So instead of teaching the same thing over and over on a two to three year cycle, as I've known some others to do, uh, this has challenged me. Uh, this process has, has forced me to study things that I would not have studied otherwise. Uh, some of you have said to me through the years, I have never participated in a Bible class at any church I've ever been to on Second Chronicles. Me either. 
I've never had a class on 2 Chronicles. I've never known any Bible class to study through 2 Chronicles verse by verse. And some of you have said the same thing about Ezekiel or Isaiah. You know, we study the Gospel accounts, we study Romans, we study Acts, but you know, who studies the books of Samuel and Kings on a regular basis? So it, it's really forced us to uh, get the big picture. Slightly related to this, I've come to appreciate some parts of the Bible more than others. Hope that's okay to admit. It's not that I don't like certain parts of the Bible, but I'll, I'll say there are some parts that I enjoy more than others. Um, so we've moved a bit faster, for example, through the last half of Ezekiel, as opposed to moving a bit slower through a book like 1 John. Not that 1 John is any more inspired, uh, more inspired than Ezekiel, that's not the case, but uh, I appreciate 1 John more than the book of Ezekiel. Uh, my apologies to Ezekiel. Um, it's a great book, we need to study it, but uh, we've kind of focused on certain areas more than others. In terms of highlights, I enjoyed the book of Acts when we first got together 21 years ago. Uh, surprisingly, I enjoyed the Song of Solomon in a way that I really, I didn't appreciate that book before. Some of you may remember I went to Whole Foods and found some, some of the food that Solomon refers to in that book. We had pomegranates, for example, and um, I cooked some barley loaves. Uh, that might have been Song of Solomon, it might have been some other class, but uh, those times when we ate what we were studying, <laughs> that stuck in my memory. I guess that would go in the, the changing methods uh, category there. But all of this falls under the category of these lessons being good for me. I'm different now than I was 21 years ago for many reasons, but uh, this class is certainly has been a part of that. Uh, by the way, speaking of personal change, I want to share two pictures of me from way back when. And this first picture, I think, is from when we first moved here. I think this was in the spring of 2000. And I would have been, I think, 27 years old in this picture. Some of you might be 27. I, I don't want to call you out who I think you are, but uh, anyway, this is back when I had a face. And uh, back in the summer or the spring of 2000, and the next picture, I think, is from the fall of 2001. This is right after we moved into our new church building on Acewood Boulevard. Um, so I had moved on uh, to a flat top and a beard. This was a starter beard. Um, but speaking of personal growth, look what you people have done to me over the past 21 years. <laughs> These are the before photos, and here I am after. All right, so anyway, I point this out just to illustrate the idea of personal growth, that uh, I appreciate this class, and uh, I am different in many ways now uh, than I was back then. Uh, the last thing I appreciate is the long-term relationship that's developed through the years. Not only have I changed personally, but the church itself, all of us together as a family have matured, and we've grown and we've changed as a congregation through the years in some good ways. Uh, we are a different congregation than we were when we started this study 21 years ago. We have grown and matured together. People have moved to Madison. People have moved away. Uh, people have been born. People have died. And uh, we, we have grown and matured. We have changed as a congregation. When we first moved here, our Wednesday class was held in Bill and Jane Bussey's living room. Uh, this is a terrible picture quality-wise, but uh, some of you may remember... And I may recognize Starla standing up there in the middle. Juanita is uh, sitting in the chair on the right-hand side there. I think that is Janet Miller there on the bottom right-hand corner. That may be Ruth Conrad in the blue jacket in the middle. Uh, somebody is apparently talking to Kathy Hyatt sitting down there. I, I can't, I don't know exactly who that person is. And then I used to teach in that folding chair in the corner of the living room, right up there in the top middle. I remember... Uh, teaching next to the rotating Christmas tree. Do you remember that? The Bussies had the rotating Christmas tree. Uh, and that, that I'd never seen anything like that before. So I'd be teaching and something would brush my arm and I'd look over and it was the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree was moving. The Christmas tree rotated. But uh, Bill and Jane were extremely gracious, weren't they, in opening their home to all of us. Uh, cleaning up, setting up chairs, taking the chairs down, putting them away, cleaning up again over and over and over, week after week for years until we found the building that we're in now. And so we're very thankful to the Bussy family for that. Uh, this picture is better quality-wise. I think this was taken maybe in the summer of 2001. Over to the right, Juanita is holding Tabitha. So Tabitha has arrived on the scene now. Uh, Keola Stacy and Christine Burns are on the couch. 
There's my empty chair in the corner. Patsy and Terry Brummel are on the couch, kind of facing us in this picture. Charles there in the blue shirt at the top left. Uh, the Moran family sitting together in the middle, and then Marlon and Ruth Conrad on the back row. And uh, I'm apparently standing up on the stairs taking this picture. And then the last one is taken from my point of view as the teacher from the corner chair. So Christine Burns on the couch, then Stacy and Kaola holding Tabitha, and then Juanita and Al. Uh, somebody's back there on the back row. I don't know exactly who that is. Starla up on the stairs. Uh, I can barely make out Marlon and Ruth Conrad and then the Moran family again. But I share these just to show um, that the church has changed through the years, haven't we? We are a different group of people now than we were then. And we've experienced some things as a congregation. We have matured. We have learned through the years. And this is something that comes to my mind as I think back over the past 21 years. And so I am thankful then that we have grown together as a congregation. Uh, thank you for your patience with me as the teacher in this Wednesday class. Uh, as to the future, my plan for several years has been for us to finish with Luke and then to transition back into the book of Acts. Remember, Luke is volume one, the life of Jesus. Acts is volume two, the growth of the early church. Both are written by Luke. Both are written to Theophilus. And so it would make sense for us to go from one to the other. So we're going to go from Luke. We're going to go to Acts. I do not want to be tied to the same schedule over the next 21 years. We are not replaying all of this. We're starting over. We're going from there. We'll see what the church needs. And uh, Acts just makes sense after Luke. I do want us to take at least one week off, we might say, by looking at one more worksheet next week. It's one we didn't cover a few months ago when we did the others. It's actually one that we use more often than the others, and it's just the plan of salvation, the steps in God's plan. So let's do that study as a standalone study next week, taking a little bit of a breather between Luke and Acts, and then we'll get back into Acts the week after that, if the Lord wills. Uh, I'm still looking for sermon ideas, by the way. I haven't heard from anybody yet. I can't pass out the cards and, and harass you <laughs> for a response as I normally do on Sunday morning in person. But uh, if you have anything that we need to cover in sermon form, please let me know about that. I would love to hear from you. Uh, as we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for letting us study your word again tonight. Thank you for the well-researched account of your son's life on this earth coming to us through the pen of Luke, the beloved physician. Thank you for making us a part of the Four Lakes congregation. Thank you for allowing us to grow closer to your son together as a group. Thank you for putting us in the same spiritual family so that we can learn how to love each other as we should. Tonight we ask that you bless and protect those who serve in health care, we look around us and we are surrounded by suffering and loneliness and people are tired. Be with those who use their skills to hold back the darkness, whether physical or emotional. Give them strength, the strength that they need as they serve. Thank you again for the Bible and thank you for sparing our lives long enough to look at every word together as a congregation. What a blessing it has been. But more than anything, we're looking forward to seeing you face to face. For now, we come to you through Jesus, the eternal word. Amen.